Hello, I'm Fuli Batibo. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera. You look at the world of business and economics. This week, Europe threatened with gas shortages and looks for alternatives to supplies from Russia. Can African nations fill the energy gap? Also this week, as the war in Ukraine rattles the global economy, could it lead to a change in the order of the financial world? And what's the impact on nations worldwide, both rich and poor? And breaking through so-called walled gardens, the European Union agrees to curb the dominance of technology companies. But will the new regulations allow fair competition on the Internet? And can they set a global standard? Thank you for joining us. The war in Ukraine is squeezing Russian gas supplies to Europe. EU countries want to reduce their dependence on Moscow and are pulling out all the stops to find alternative supplies. Africa has a wealth of natural gas reserves and could fill the gap. Many European countries are exploring whether the continent could be part of the energy solution they desperately need. Many African countries are eyeing the opportunity and have expressed their interest in increasing supplies to Europe. Europe imported about 108 billion cubic meters of LNG from Africa in 2019, over 12 billion of which came from Nigeria. The nation has recently approved a roadmap to construct a multi-billion trans-Saharan gas pipeline known as Nigal. The project will run through Niger and Algeria and connects to Europe's existing network. Now, pipelines that transport gas from Africa to Europe are mainly located in North Africa. The Maghreb Europe gas pipeline in Algeria transfers natural gas to Spain and Portugal through Morocco. But supplies have been disrupted because of political tensions between Algiers and Rabat. The U.S. Secretary of State is thought to have discussed the reopening of the pipeline during his recent visit to both countries. The Megdas pipeline links Algeria directly to Spain. The African nation is estimated to have exported 255 million cubic meters of gas to Spain in 2020. The Transmed pipeline connects Algeria to Italy through Tunisia. Algeria is Italy's second largest gas exporter after Russia. The Greenstream submarine pipelines run from western Libya to the island of Sicily in Italy. But that makes up just 2.5% of overall Italian daily demand. Now, the shift in global energy markets raises questions about how countries can meet their climate goals. While Europe says it wants to cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55 percent by 2030 and make the transition to green energy alternatives, activists have pushed for a halt to African gas investments, an effort that forced foreign companies to rethink their operations on the continent. Well, to find out more about Africa's gas potential, I'm now joined by Kola Karim, the Group Managing Director of Shoreline Energy International and an African Energy Chamber Advisory Board member. He joins us from London. Mr. Karim, thank you very much for being with us on Counting the Cost. Many African countries have expressed interest in increasing gas supplies to Europe, but do they have the capacity to do this? They do have by way of reserves. Uh, if you look at a country like Nigeria with 210 TCF of natural gas reserves. You look at Mozambique with over 100 TCF of natural gas reserves. So it's established that the reserves there. But what is more important is the capital to build the infrastructure to actually fill and bridge that gap. And that's what's missing today. So it's a difficult one because with decarbonization, capital is scarce and Africa's always the last point of call her huge capital is going to look at for such infrastructure. So missing middle is capital is required to bridge that gap, but the reserves are there mm. because of the potentials all these African countries are sitting on. So there's the infrastructure challenge, challenge, as you say, and then the funding, of course, also. Where will it come from? Look, the, the true position is this. Right now, I think this, the shifting policy from what has happened between Russia and Ukraine is actually pointing capital and serious investors who are now forced to look for alternatives with the announcements and pronouncements by the EU cutting natural gas imports and, and oil imports from Russia, looking for alternate sources, and Africa hopefully should be the natural choice. Mm. So the capital should be coming from that market. Right. So then how quickly do you expect the, the gas to start flowing north after years of underinvestment? 
Look, it, it is also a difficult one. There mm. is gas flowing already from Algeria. The potential hookup is the Trans-Saharan gas, which is looking at hooking Nigeria up and connecting that to Algeria with potentials of more exports into Europe. Right. Another, hopefully, 30 billion cubic meter. But the true thing is, how long is it going to take to build that infrastructure? And that's the elephant in the room. Indeed, and I was going to ask you about that. The Trans-Saharan pipeline, Niger, Nigeria and Algeria have said they've agreed a roadmap. But is this just a pipe dream, do you think? How challenging is it going to be to get this project going? You know, the, the true position is that it's going to be challenging because of the recent security problems we've had in the Sahel. Now, but the true thing is with commitments and the zeal from the Europeans looking for alternate sources, the reality is assured. We're talking about 13 to $15 billion of capital to be spent on this project. That's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But it's not insurmountable capital that cannot be found because the European buyers, the European market are now forced looking for alternative source of energy and Africa naturally by proximity of of distance is the natural choice. Yeah, you talked about the security concerns and there have been security concerns over the years, especially in a country like Nigeria, for example, which has struggled with armed groups and also disagreements over the, the, the fair distribution of, of the oil wealth. Do you think those security concerns have been addressed to allow you know, th this project to go ahead? The security concerns, as it pertains to Nigeria and the Sahel, is an ongoing issue that will and is being addressed on a daily basis. It is not going to be an easy task, right? The biggest problem has been poverty. If you look at all the trouble spots in, 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 in sub-Saharan Africa, mm. the biggest problem is poverty. Right. And if our people and the people in these areas are prosperous, I'm sure we'll see far reduced incursions and, and problems. So I think governments are focusing on it and trying to address it. It's not going to be an easy task, but the focus is trying to get something done. Right. There's the poverty issue and then there are the politics also. We saw the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, travel to Algeria and Morocco this week. Uh, there's a question, of course, of opening up the uh, gas pipeline from Algeria to Europe via Morocco, which had been shut down last year after uh, Algeria suspended ties with Morocco because of the issue of, of Western Sahara. How... You know, how do you see that going forward? Is, is that issue likely to be resolved? Can the U.S. help bring these two countries together? You, you know, the true position of, of what we see in reality of global politics is when the Western nations have a problem, they always try and they always find a way in getting things resolved. So you will see the situation in between Morocco and Algeria will resolve itself because of it necessitates flow of gas into the European markets to elevate the potential problems that we're seeing today. Look, Russia exports over 300 million cubic meters a day into the European Union. Mm -hmm. That's about 150 billion cubic meters a year. That's huge. If an example, the largest economy in Europe, Germany, that's 55% of their gas imports. Right. If you disrupt that, you're disrupting the economy of the strongest European nation. So it's not going to be an easy task. And emergency position is what has been put in place in finding adequate replacement to support if there's going to be a shift. But right now, the focus and policy that's been pronounced is reduction in importation from Russia. Mm -hmm. And that's gap, the gap, potential gap, has got to be filled. Thank you so much. Very interesting to talk to you about this. Kola Karim, Managing Director of Shoreline Energy International. Thank you for being on Counting the Costs. Thank you. And Ukraine's president has asked Qatar and other gas-rich nations to produce more to counter what he called the Russian threat to use energy as a weapon. Vladimir Zelensky made the plea here in Doha while speaking to leaders at the Doha Forum. Zelensky also warned that no country is immune to the impact of the Russian invasion of his country, citing the high in food prices. Russia is the world's largest exporter of wheat and Ukraine is the fifth largest. But the global disruption to global supplies goes beyond oil and grains. The flow of many metals is also at risk. So...
Should the world be worried about the impact of economic deprivations that could be caused by the war in Ukraine? Well, my colleague Nick Clark put this and other questions to Kelly Kraft, the former U.S. permanent representative to the United Nations. He spoke to her at the Doha Forum. You know, I think in the United States, there's this saying that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And that is no longer the, the case. What happens in Ukraine affects the entire world. And that's why we are here at the Doha Forum. I mean, the, the entire the topic has really been around Ukraine, Russia. And I look at this in a way from a Security Council standpoint and from a General Assembly standpoint in the fact that within the Security Council, we have seen Russia be able to veto their own punishment, their own reprimand. But then you have the General Assembly, and I think that's really shown a spotlight on the fact that every country has their has an equal vote. There are no vetoes. But it also allowed us to see the African countries and who abstained, who voted, the one that voted with Russia. And it kind of shows us that there are winners and losers if you think about it, with Russia, with, with the, especially with the way that Russia has gone into several of the countries in Africa with gold, with their Wagner groups, you know, mm -hmm. protecting the gold mines, with the fact that they're looking at the rare earth minerals in, in Congo or diamonds. And so you, you can see the winners and the losers. You can see some of these countries within Africa whose leadership are really very short-sighted and they're looking at short-term gain instead of long-term gain and building up their country. Because this is a country, this is a continent of the most, of the most youth, of the youngest. Right. And we're losing our focus on building up future generations. Because it, it is those countries that will be deeply affected because the knock-on effect from commodity prices, right. for example, and, and the price of food, that's gonna have a huge issue in places like Yemen and, and across, the continent, across the continent of Africa. Well, and you look, and just from this previous panel, you look at Yemen, and it's unfortunate that we're all focused on Ukraine, Russia, but yet we still we do have this one of the world's worst famine in Yemen, and Yemen is directly affected because of, with the World Food Program and all of the different humanitarian resources, wheat being the main commodity there. So we're seeing that not only affect the continent of Africa, but we're seeing that in Yemen also. Uh, Ukraine's economy is also taking a severe hit. How can how can it cope in the meantime while the conflict is going on, and what about moving forward as things perhaps settle down at some point in the coming months, what help will be provided to Ukraine? You know, if you look at the, the industries or, or just the, the agricultural business in Ukraine, and for that matter, the Russian farmers that were fed disinformation, most of them don't even know what's really occurred. So we really, we need to be building up now, we need to be helping the agricultural industry in Ukraine, the industries that really had the most exports because that's where they're going to need to rebuild their country is starting with the basics just the basic needs which are going to be their their export market right there has been this talk of a kind of collective effort mm -hmm. to deal with situations like this this freedom fund mm -hmm. what do you make of that as a, as a as a way forward to try and deal with these kind of situations you know i think the freedom fund is very important but we need to remember we need to be able to utilize the people within Ukraine. We need to be able to build up their economy by also giving these very people the jobs to rebuild when this fund is activated. There's been this, this great collective effort to uh, put sanctions on Russia. Do you think we've gone far enough? In my personal opinion, in the Security Council, whenever we spoke about sanctions, they didn't mean a thing to Russia. And if you look at the way our, our currency is today with our cryptocurrency and other forms of currency, the dollar is not that powerful. So sanctions really being placed on Russia, they're, you know, they're no longer asking for U.S. dollars because they can work around. There's lots of loopholes. We need to figure out the loopholes and look at that area. That's how we're going to have these sanctions that work. But the problem is, of course, that there's no way of putting the, the screws on Russia or on, on Putin. Uh, without implicating uh, and having a, a, a serious effect on the global economy. How do you get around that? Well, we needed to be building up our economy. If you want to look at the United States and the administration that I served, candidate Trump at, the point, at that time talked about the importance of building up our industry within our country because of China. And then when he was you know, President Trump, he acted upon that. 
we need to continue, speak about China for a second, we need to continue to build up our country so that we're not dependent. You know, here we are now, energy dependent. When we were energy independent, we were producing our oil. We had, you know, Keystone Pipeline. Instead, we immediately relieved sanctions on gas prom on the um, pipeline in Germany. Why would we do that when we can be energy independent in our own country? Let's just hope that next year that we're all not sitting here and we're not discussing China, Taiwan. Now, giant technology companies are not only getting bigger, they've already eclipsed major oil firms. They've also made huge earnings. An idea of just how lucrative their business is, Apple's profit alone for the past year was more than the yearly profit of eight major companies combined, and they include Disney and McDonald's. But just a handful of tech companies are dominating the market. Well, now the European Union aims to curb their power by agreeing far-reaching rules that could allow smaller companies to flourish. Some have said it. It was a bit like the Wild West. It was a bit in their hands. We have regained power because we're political authorities. We said to them, of course you are welcome in this space that represents the digital internal market, but these are our rules. The legislation is the EU's biggest overhaul of laws governing big tech operations in more than two decades. It requires platforms to open up access to their spaces to third parties or other businesses. This means users of the WhatsApp messaging service, for example, could text a friend using a different service. And tech giants wouldn't be allowed to rank their own products or services higher than those of others in search results. Software or apps such as web browsers can't be installed by default, and companies won't be able to combine users' personal data from different platforms for targeted ads unless explicit consent is given, among many other rules. Repeat violations of the regulation could result in fines of up to 20% of a company's global annual revenue, and companies could be temporarily banned from conducting mergers and acquisitions. The Digital Market Act will apply to what the EU calls gatekeepers. Those are companies with a market value of more than $83 billion and with at least 45 million monthly users or 10,000 business users in the EU. The firms must also have a core platform service like a social media, a search engine provider or an app store. The group includes Alphabet, the owner of Google, YouTube, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft and Meta. Now, Apple has raised concerns about privacy and security vulnerabilities for its users, while Google said some parts of the rules could affect innovation. The Digital Market Act came hours before the U.S. and the EU agreed a provisional deal on cross-border data transfers. President Joe Biden says the pact would facilitate more than $7 trillion in economic relationships with the EU. Well, to discuss all this, I'm now joined from St. Galen University in Switzerland by Simon Evnet. He's a professor of international trade and economic development at St. Galen University and is also an expert in competition law. Thank you very much, Mr. Evnet, for being with us on Counting the Cost. So what do you make of this, these new rules? Will they ensure fair competition and, and more choice for users? These rules will certainly shift the competitive landscape in favour of the smaller or medium-sized firms, away from the big digital behemoths. Whether this translates into much benefit for consumers will depend critically on whether those small or medium-sized firms use that competitive space to introduce new innovative services uh, which uh, expand choice and deliver benefits. I think that's the key question. Right. And so a key aim of the reform is to prevent tech giants uh, from abusing their market position to harm smaller rivals. But what will this mean for those big tech giants? How will it affect their business model and, and will it mean less profit for them? Uh, the big tech giants differ considerably in their business models. This legislation has been written in a way to target eight different types of uh, uh, digital activity, commercial activity. And in each of them, it's pretty uh, clear that the uh, implementation of this, if it's faithfully implemented, is likely to reduce the profitability of the bigger, uh, bigger players. There are a, a number of constraints that, are, that they will be under. For example, uh, operators of platforms will not be able to force sellers on those platforms to have to use their uh, f financial payment systems. So these types of uh, restrictions are going to be put in place mm. and will widen choice for buyers and for sellers 
at the expense of the big players. Right. There are concerns that the laws target American companies un unfairly and that it could affect jobs in the US. Do you think those concerns are justified? I think the, the, the rules have been written in a way that if a firm becomes larger than certain specified limits, then they fall within the reach. But it should be said that there are Chinese firms as well as American firms which will uh, become so-called gatekeepers in, under these laws and be subject to these tougher disciplines. So I don't necessarily see it as being inherent or automatically anti-American firms. But the, the, truth, the truth is most of the most successful companies in Western markets in the digital space are American. So any large company uh, which has been successful is likely to get wrapped into these rules. And many of them are American. So you can understand where the criticism comes from. Right. And so what will be the challenges implementing the, these new rules, these new measures? Do you see companies trying to diminish the law's impacts in, in the courts, for example? The companies will have many options in terms of how they react to this particular uh, legislation. One, one option will be to challenge whether or not a company is designated as a gatekeeper, which is what you need to be designated to fall under the provisions in this particular law. So the first thing the giants will do, I think, will be to contest whether they're designated as gatekeepers. And then if the European Commission comes after them subsequently with enforcement actions, those will get contested as well. Mm. So I think, yes, the lawyers will be very busy. Yeah. Are there concerns about privacy and innovation, as some tech firms have suggested? So the, the big tech firms have suggested that innovation could be diminished. And, mm -hmm. and there, the, the argument, I think they have some merit in saying this. The European Commission has um, conceded that point. But the counter argument is that the additional innovation from the small and medium sized firms will, ca will um, offer benefits to consumers. So that's the trade off which is being taken there. On privacy, please note, and it's important for your uh, viewers to know this, that uh, privacy is not the subject of this legislation. Okay. Privacy will be the subject of another piece of legislation the European Commission is going to bring forward. OK, interesting that you, you mentioned that. Now, we talked about users briefly. Uh, how are they going to be affected, but also not just the users, the advertisers? How are they going to be impacted by, by these new laws? Well, users will probably have more choice in terms of uh, different services being offered on platforms. So that will be a, a step forward. Uh, but the advertisers, I think there the message is mixed. The good news for them is that they will be able to get much more information about the effectiveness of their advertising out of the big digital firms. The bad news is that to the extent uh, that, um, uh, that these platforms become less attractive because other firms are, are rising up and competing against them, then uh, you may end up getting reaching fewer consumers. So for the advertisers, I think the message or the outcome is likely to be mixed. OK. Now, this is the EU's largest uh, overhaul of laws governing uh, the way tech giants operate. Do you think it cements Europe's leadership uh, role here as the most assertive regulator of big tech? And do you see this being adopted globally? So there's two things there. Mm. First, the EU has um, taken a lead on digital regulation, but so has China in terms of its own domestic market. It's not clear to me who wins that horse race, but both of them have demonstrated that they have a lot of teeth and they're willing to use it. The second, um, uh, the, the, the second point, sorry, please remember, what was your second yes, question? Yes, is it going to be adopted globally, you think? Ah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, the Brussels effect uh, will probably apply. That's, that's the uh, effect whereby Brussels moves and other countries copy. Right. I think we will see some emulation of this and possibly even in the United States as well. Thank you so much for talking to us about this. Simon Evnett, Professor of Trade and Economic Development at St. Galen University. Thank you very much for being with us on Counting the Cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is our show for this week. Get in touch with us by tweeting me at Foliba AJE and do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or drop us an email, counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our address. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That will take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links and entire episodes for you to catch up on. That's it for this edition of Counting the Costs. I'm Fully Batibo from the whole team here in Doha. Thank you for watching. The news on Al Jazeera is next.